hello everyone uh, and uh, uh, hi alexander so uh thanks everyone i think uh, we are starting or live today it's a bit uh, i think it's about a bit different time but we are recording this lives both at instagram and youtube so if you are here you can ask question that would be great otherwise also you can still uh, take a look at them and watch them on youtube or instagram and others so we try to be i mean uh, like provide them as much as possible so that hopefully you can use them so uh, today uh, we have a, a great uh, guest uh, professor alexander uh, matri of mit uh, he has actually uh, lots of awards and some of the things that i think he's famous about it he has i think Uh, like best paper award in four of uh, theory uh, best uh, conferences i think was it two or uh, like uh, you had in all of them no uh, yes i think so yes i think i managed yeah. to get all of them yes yeah, i think yeah, i mentioned it i mean other than that he got the uh, acm doctoral dissertation award honorable mention uh, persberger award that gives to young uh, um, scientists, computer scientists, among others. And he can talk about uh, more about his research and we will talk more about his research there. So he has been uh, at MIT since uh, 2000, uh, no, he got his PhD in 2011 from MIT and he has been a professor there, um, I think now for the past uh, five, six years. Something like that, you know, time flies yeah, fast, yeah. but yeah, that makes yeah. uh, that, that, that's yeah. quite right. Mm -hmm. uh, great. Uh, good. So uh, today we are talking about uh, two uh, important concepts. So he worked actually more on theoretical computer science algorithm design. He had very great papers. And then he decided to also do more for ML stuff. So that would be a great opportunity for us to know, I mean, what was the way that he was thinking, and hopefully we will go into some of these uh, details uh, about the research, and like the going back and forth between theory and ML. He is still publishing in theory conferences as well. Uh, good, so uh, I think with this uh, brief uh, like a description of your great work, we will uh, go and we always start talking about uh, you when you were a child. So when you were a child, did you imagine that you want to be a scientist or like you will be at the place that you are here essentially at MIT, you got your PhD from MIT and then you are at MIT and you are <laughs> professor with lots of work. So we will start from this. Sure, uh, thank you, Mohammed, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, so yeah. So, you know, as you review all these PhD applications, like some of them start with always the story when I was five years old, I already knew that I kind of want to solve puzzles or something. So essentially, like, first of all, don't do it on your PhD application. I don't think that's the right thing to say. But also, like, I definitely wasn't like that. So it's, to be honest, even up until college, the only thing I knew I wanted to do is maybe, you know, program computer games. And that was about it. Uh, the only time when I started kind of getting inclined into science is when I actually joined, uh, you know, joined my, uh, like my undergrad in Poland, again, with an intention of learning how to program so I can uh, program computer games. And then I kind of, you know, I have a bunch of friends who were kind of from my high school and they were much into Olympiads and stuff. And kind of, they just started like, kind of essentially, I went with them to some of the charismatic professor and it looked kind of cool and you know we were smart enough to get by in the end everyone got an A anyway because this is one of these classes so so at first it started like as a social kind of uh, social exercise but over time when we went to the kind of next class given by this professor kind of things started to make sense and you kind of started to engage with the material and then at that time indeed you know you start to 
I realized that, oh, actually, there is such a thing as being a scientist. In particular, you can do science about computer science, even though, you know, the name would suggest that. And that is actually cool. And only then, uh, kind of, I really said, okay, actually, I really like doing research. I see, you know, how much, you know, how much uh, pleasure I can get from that. So, you know, only that, only then it started. So, yeah, so I definitely didn't imagine that I would be doing science, let alone I will be where I am, you know, even though I enjoy where I am quite a bit. Mm, great. So uh, one question, actually, you got your bachelor in Poland. We will discuss uh, more about education in Poland. But you got your bachelor both in theoretical physics and computer science, correct? Uh, how did you, I mean, combine this? Yes. Do you still like uh, physics and are you still using it in your research? Uh, yes, yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, so actually, it's interesting. So, okay, so I don't think if it's listening in my CV, but like I started my, okay, so, so the story was the following. Okay? So I, I joined my computer, the computer science degree as an undergrad, you know, the, totally normal. And again, because of this friend, my interest, by the end of the first year, I essentially kind of wanted to uh, like, you know, kind of start expanding my interest. In particular, I wanted to take some math classes. So I kind of became, uh, you know, like I got a special status in the university to be able to take math classes from the math department. But then actually like, you know, as much as I like computer science, I always also liked physics. And in some ways, you know, actually I kind of, the reason why I got into my uh, computer science degree was because of a physics Olympiad. Uh, so kind of, so I always had this interest in physics. So I realized, well, actually, you know, why about, you know, I actually like, you know, follow up on my love for physics as well. And I enroll in a separate degree, undergraduate degree in theoretical physics. So I would say that, uh, you know, this was more of a hobby slash, you know, I really was curious about physics and I wanted to know more. So that's why I took the second kind of the second degree that I was doing in parallel. In the end, it did indeed inform some of my research. So during my undergrad, uh, for some time, I actually was also working on quantum uh, cryptography. So yes. obviously I was quite at, you know, quite comfortable with notions of, you know, uh, quantum mechanics and so on from my uh, degree in theoretical physics. So anyway, but like, I think that's about it. You know, the other thing is that, you know, I still remember what Feynman diagrams are or what, you know, the QFT quantum field theory is. And again, it was fun, but I don't think, I don't expect it to use it in my research anymore, but who knows what the future will bring. Uh, great. Uh, yeah, actually, I mean, uh, I was thinking that, I mean, some part of ML also, it has some uh, I mean, intersection with physics, like, we are doing, like, computer science, for example, in the phase transitions, also physics come to play, and there's a lot of people who are uh, working on phase transitions, actually, from both community of physics, theoretical physics, and computer science, or even math, they are working on it. So I can imagine yes, so, that even, so actually, are, for deep fine. networks, that we are working, some of them come to play as well, these concepts of physics. But we can talk more about them uh, later. Now, uh, uh, good. So, uh, like, uh, you are originally uh, from uh, Poland. So, uh, uh, like, what was the education there? I think we will talk, we had several international uh, uh, faculty from different places, originally from different places. And they talk about, I mean, different places. So how is it going with math and computer science in Poland? I see. So that's a good question. Uh, and kind of, you know, this question has two answers. Like there's, a, there's an answer to this question during the time when I was in the system. And there is an answer how the things look like right now. And you know, in general, like, you know, my experience with this, you know, math and computer science education in Poland was very positive. Uh, so essentially, like, what was really nice is that there really was, a, I would say, culture of excellence and kind of recognition that like, you know, like it, it's, it's good to be good in sciences. And of course, like traditionally math and physics were always kind of, you know, uh, very highly regarded. You know, this is also something about space race, uh, like slash, you know, in communist countries, you know, even though by this time, uh, Poland was no longer communist, like that was kind of the, the ethos of like math and physics being like one of the highest callings. Uh, and then also computer science was this new thing that people were really into and people really wanted to kind of, um, you know, to uh, learn about. So essentially, so there was this kind of 
intellectual ferment of like cool things happening and people really wanting to get into it. So in particular, what was nice is that, you know, I was lucky to be in a very good, uh, you know, high school that was kind of, you know, uh, the best one in the, in my town, which was a relatively big town and one of the best in the country. So again, so you had this really inspired teachers who kind of, and most importantly, you had a lot of peers that kind of excelled in the subject, which kind of really made you kind of focus on, you know, on, on being excellent at this as well. Uh, and then, you know, outside of that, there was a lot of kind of additional like groups of interest where essentially what was happening is that there were some academic, uh, 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 academic uh, teachers, like some faculty kind of teaching eager students you know, after hours, you know, like some of the advanced concepts in math or in physics or in computer science. So kind of the, just, just out of passion. This was for free. This was, if you're interested, you can, you can go there. So there was this whole ecosystem there that was not only within the kind of high school and then in the, you know, undergrad, uh, you know, that there was kind of this interest in being excellent in something, in excelling. And there, but there's also like, you know, all of this system that allows you, like, if you are interested, in improving yourself in something. There was a lot of resources to call upon. So that's kind of what the situation, uh, you know, at that time, uh, things have changed a little bit from what I understand now. And the main thing that changed is the system a bit. So essentially what happens when I was, uh, you know, in the system, uh, like all these high schools and then the, and, uh, like the colleges, they had entrance exams. They had like a, a custom entrance exams. Uh, and of course, this you know there are pros and cons of entrance exams. But you know, I was on the lucky part of this is that essentially like there was a selection, there was a funnel effect. You know, I usually scrape by kind of you know into getting into like better places than maybe I would you know on average get. And this kind of always allows you this kind of path of, of advance, advancement. What's happening right now? There is only like you know there is one central exam. Uh, on both the like high school level and uh, at the uh, undergraduate level and essentially like it's a central exam and based on this exam at the points from this exam you get kind of get admitted to different places and this definitely like i guess the good thing is that it democratized uh, you know the access to you know to these top places much more but unfortunately there was a bit of you know like uh, this is completely natural there was a, a, a bit of like more of dispersion of talent across the country. So there was no this kind of concentration effect anymore that, you know, I definitely benefited with being, being lucky there. So, so this is kind of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the most differences. Having said that, Poland is still uh, very strong in both in computer science uh, education and in math and in physics. Uh, but yeah, uh, it kind of things changed quite a bit since I was there. Uh, great. So I think now this is this kind of central exam that like for example, we at Iran had this one. Uh, this is called Concord in Iran that everyone needs to pass it. Actually, it was the case even I think we were talking about Taiwan or like other, even I think China had it and we had yeah. it with other guests. So uh, that's interesting. I mean, sometimes it might be more fair at the same time is more stress than others. Like it's not... Yes. Like everyone, yeah. I think it has pros and cons. I don't no, know. It, it, it definitely has. By the way, like just uh, the one thing I want to mention is a very important difference between what's in Iran or in India or in China. It's the thing is that these exams are really hard and like really, really hard and kind of, you know, essentially like if you look at the gradation of people, like there's very few people, if ever anyone or very rarely someone who can kind of completely ace the exams. The problem in Poland is that these exams are not too difficult. So what happens is that many people get maximum scores and then it's kind of, it, it's not, it's not kind of differentiating between this like well, very, very good and absolutely top. So maybe that's, sorry, that's a very important difference. So, so in the past, yes. you know, like the point is that this, when these exams were individual, they were calibrated, you know, like if you are a top institution in the country, you really made it hard. So you can kind of see the right, you know, the right spread. Uh, while you know here there is one for all the, for for all the for all the country and there is no like in some ways it's it's easy to max out well not easy but it's definitely not uncommon to max out this exam and then it's kind of you have a bunch of candidates who all seem to be equally qualified and then you you have to go by you know by some just tiebreakers yeah so in some sense i mean the, the, as you mentioned actually that's a good <laughs> interesting way i didn't consider this way 
Yeah, you can have I mean, one exam that exactly says where is your place. Because like, that's like in Iran. Depending, I mean, you cannot get all questions correct. So yeah. surely there is, uh, I mean, there is an exact ranking that they can rank the people one by one. But you can have this kind of exam or some kind of just passing the bar. That if you have this, it's like easier so you can pass the bar. After that, then still this local universities and others, they have more authority to uh, select the people. Yeah, that so, might be actually a better way of, I mean, somehow having both options in some sense. Yeah, so, so, so this was the system before, like in a sense that like there is, was a central exam, but yeah, exactly. this was just about being above the bar. And then there were exams for individual uh, universities to exactly calibrate in the right ratio. So now mm -hmm. uh, the second stage is forbidden. So you only can go by this, you know, initial exam. And, and it didn't become harder. It didn't actually it become, it became easier. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, uh, that's a longer story. Uh, and then, so for these top guys, though, if all of them have the 100, then how do they choose the universities? Yes, yeah, so... If they uh, cannot also have their own exam. Well, you know, yes, yeah, so, so the only, like, I think, uh, like, remaining signal that's left is Olympiads. So essentially, okay. like, being performance, so, so I think that's where the preference happens. And again, in the end, you know, like, still the top people usually end up in the, in the same places, but... I think for some reason there is, it's a little bit more dispersed. Uh, like essentially like, again, by the way, uh, you know, maybe this is me, but I actually on this above the bar exam, I did not do, like I did very well, like I aced math, you know, I aced uh, kind of physics and so on, but like on the Polish, like the Polish language one, I did very poorly for whatever reason, actually below what was my typical performance. So you see, so there might be many kind of reasons like where, you know, if there is an exam just on math, you know, kind of you get one read, but if the exam is kind of across different s subjects, you know, you are maximizing a bit different, optimizing a bit different, uh, different, uh, you know, different objective. But, you know, these things are complicated and, you know, and I'm sure there are many other factors that also played into it. I do think, and this is what I know talking to my Indian friends, the thing happening in India, but in general, like, you know, it used to be that, you know, there is this, you know, a joint entrance exam that you know that they have and again usually what happens is you know that the toppers of that exam like number one like or like n number one to five or even more they all wanted to go to do to, to do, go to academia and now they are more no we will go into consulting companies or we will do business startups so so i think that's also kind of i think that's why we maybe it's not the emphasis on science is not that strong anymore as it used to be because there are all these other opportunities that kind of draw people's interest there so maybe you don't want to be like amazing at olympiads or amazing at programming maybe you just want to have an interesting you know start working early so you can then start a business and something and, and something so that might be also part of the trend yeah i think um, we, do, we don't want to go that much we can, we can go for or essentially in this one. But I think in short, I will say, I mean, this idea that like you have several opportunities would be good because like this, uh, this is one problem with these central exams that like you have one exam for the whole year. If yes. you are like essentially you had a bad, you are sick at that day, that's it. You yeah. lost at least one year of your life, if not more essentially, yes. because then you need to prepare for this thing. So if you have several exams with the same knowledge, I think that's somehow, uh, maybe smooth the process much better. At least, well, maybe you didn't get this one, but there is another option that you can take it. Uh, and these are lots of stress also. That's one thing that you need to consider. Actually, for me, I remember uh, this was actually, I didn't have the, I didn't need to do the concourse because in Iran, if you go to Olympia, then you need to, you don't need to have a concourse. However, I remember actually, uh, before going, I got uh, to this uh, informatics Olympiad, uh, the International Informatics Olympiad, before going there, I was always thinking that how much stress I will have in that contest. Because, you know, that's also, I mean, it's not just preparation. You need to write the code that the codes can be wrong. So that was one of my nightmares to go there. When I went there, I think that was much better. But before going there, just thinking about that. And also, like, for example, I think it is also like Poland is very good in both uh, Olympiads as well as this ACM or like ICPC programming contest. Like you know, and uh, uh, that is uh, important. Like like when you go as a like one person from the country, there is a lot of expectation from you, and that's important. That there's a lot of stress. So I can like this other contest. This may 
the people may not expect you but you expect from yourself that you do well in this kind of central exam and there's a lot of essentially stress and other issues so i think that's another good concept that maybe we can discuss it later in some other talks but i think that's an interesting thing uh, great so then you applied to mit did you uh, expect that you will get admission from mit and especially now that you are a professor at mit so you review the uh, things so how do you feel when you applied and like how competitive is that okay uh, yeah so uh... you know this is a good question like yeah you know the whole story like why i even applied this is interesting you know uh, but like you know sometimes ignorance is the kind of is 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 the help uh, and and by the way you know it, just like i actually applied to us twice so the first time i didn't get into any of the schools the second times i i got into most of the schools so you know kind of this is, there is some lesson there but like it definitely was you know a little bit of a you know ignorance that kind of helped me to even try to do it because to be honest now looking back i don't know how i get in like like to be honest i don't think i would get in now if i kind of apply again to so you are uh, have a point there bottom now no no i i do i genuinely think that the bar goes higher every year like kind of this is a, like if i look at the applications in in theory like i would well i i even then probably wasn't like the obvious accept uh, but you know there were some things going for me you know i had some research project probably strong letters you know like i was not completely like it wasn't completely dumb luck but definitely you know you know that there was some rounding happening that was rounding up than uh, rounding down uh, but like yeah in today's world like it's difficult so so what we do actually when we evaluate uh, you know um, applications for phd we really try not to measure people on the absolute scale of excellence or oh, you know we only want people now who have like one stock paper already or two fox papers already because that's what we see but rather we want to measure people at the excellence normalized by the opportunities they have so if you are an amazing undergrad student in MIT you are expected to have a stock or fox paper like essentially like given the opportunities you know how easy it is to approach a professor and write a paper like if you like if you are from MIT and we try to not admit people from MIT from under, MIT undergrad but we we still do it they're really excellent but like we try not to is you know essentially like you know if you don't have a paper there is something that you know that's wrong yes so that's i would say something wrong with you but, no, no, but yeah, yeah i mean just yeah, yeah. that's like the thing that is the expectation that you have that Yes, but like you know, at that time, you know, if I'm trying to analyze my application, you know, I was coming from Poland, from a university that was good but not amazing in Poland, you know, and kind of I had you know like fo- stock fox like you know at the institution I was in, like there was no stock fox paper for like couple of years. Like now it's changing, now it's actually better. So essentially, at this point, like it would be insanely high high bar for someone to expect a paper, a published paper from me. But they saw a bunch of projects. and they could read the paper i don't know if they ever did but like it was clearly that i kind of punch above the weight within the environment that i am in and then there is a question like okay there's clearly some uncertainty bars but like you see that like this person seems to perform very very well or exceptionally well compared to the environment and the opportunities mm-hmm. they had and that's what you that's what you select for but anyway this is kind of the story i can tell myself why i was accepted but i can easily say how the story could be said differently that would lead to me not being accepted again the first time i wasn't like i was yeah. accepted yeah, I I what changed but clearly something changed yeah actually i mean i think that's it also the, i mean i got a bsc from mit and i applied to wise as well actually the first year i did, i was close but i didn't get it i think they mentioned that if you want to pay yourself you can come but i didn't have the money to pay so i went to waterloo for one year and they got my master and i applied again and then, then i could get into MIT. So I think you may try more than once. That's one thing. And I think the other point that you mentioned, it's great. So I think, uh, like, uh, I think we are doing in uh, like top places. Generally, that's a good thing to know that they will consider the environment that you have applied. So if you are great, but in a very good environment, then may, I mean, you should consider that fact that there are several other people that they competing with you is the same environment at the same time you may be some other environment but in that environment you are unique that may mean a higher weight for you i think that's the thing that i will get yeah. it especially from 
<laughs> getting admission from MIT. Uh, great. So is there anything else I think that would be good, I mean, for audience, like if you, if you want to know, given the information that you know now, is there any other things useful? Like we discussed that, should they contact MIT professor if they want to get in, or no. should they should just apply this one? <laughs> Please do not contact MIT professors. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, like th this is just uh, the only thing that can happen is this: like someone will remember your name and will ap <laughs> apply negatively. Like that's not the way to. Like first of all, not a single faculty makes decision by themselves. It's always a committee, and the faculty might not be on the committee. And you know, also like the, the things that we look at is at the letters, at your statement, and uh, at the accomplishments. And this is like. Emailing any of us does, it does not fit into any of this category and actually says, I think many of us say, including on my website, please do not email me about PhD admission because there's nothing I can help. It's like, you know, I, I need to see, to evaluate application, I need to see letters, I need to see, I need to see the whole dossier. And also there's, a, there's also a question against different candidates. So there's nothing useful I can do at this point. And it's very hard, you know, to, like, some people want to kind of do an internship, like this is really very hard to do. And to be honest, you know, actually something we are discouraged from doing by the institution, because kind of, you know, we don't want to have a, you know, a, like, you know, kind of a lot of people coming for short periods of time, because this is not actually a good academic outcome for anyone. Like essentially it's all more about more continued education. So if you want to get in the top place, what you should do is just again, look for the opportunities where you can engage for long-term in some research project around you. And again, this doesn't have to be the most famous professor in the world. That's really not about that. Like all of my, you know, kind of letter writers when I get into MIT, they were respectable people, but they were not, you know, people at the level of MIT faculty. But the point was that like, they were legitimate people. Even if the paper I wrote with them was not the Stock Fox paper, like there was clear like, okay, this, you know, the, this student, I work with him or her, you know, they were really kind of brilliant, really devoted and, you know, kind of, it's really about, this is the signal we are looking for, like kind of, is there a sign of the greed of brilliance and really, most importantly, interest in really kind of applying yourself to some deep thinking about the problem that we are looking for. So everything yeah, else, we try to do uh, so think You already actually mentioned this before, that uh, this, I mean, everything will be somehow weighted by the environment. So as you mentioned, so you don't need to work with a top person necessarily to get there. You need to work with a person. And in that, like with that person, you may, I mean, excel much more. That will be weighted much more because uh, everything will be somehow weighted by the environment that you have been there. Yes, so and, uh, and actually, uh, to just to add it, you know, uh, and yeah, we could have, do a podcast about the PhD admission advice, but like the one thing is that like the most famous and busy people, like the most famous people are really the most busy. So they will not even be, might not be able to truly engage with you, to be able to write a really informative letter. Because as Mohammed said, you know, it just, the informative is just someone who actually worked with you, really spent time with you, saw how you think, how you kind of deal with problems. These are the most informative letters. So yes, of course, we, we prefer to know the letter writers. That's so we kind of know this person is calibrated or not, but it, it's not about, oh, like, the way it's, not, it's not just, oh, is this person famous? If it's not famous person, we don't read the letter from them. The opposite. We want from someone who has informed opinion. And sometimes people, I can see students kind of pushing for getting a letter from a famous person. The famous person just, you know, sends one paragraph saying, oh yeah, this looks like a good student to me, you know, please admit it. And this, this letter doesn't really mean much. Uh, great, good. So now, I mean, we talk about MIT, actually, I think the US news ranking came recently. I mean, there are some pros and cons for that. But interestingly, I think the past 20 years that I have seen, always MIT, CMU, Berkeley, and Stanford, they were all top universities. This year, interestingly, I think they put MIT at first and all other three at rank two, I think, if you have, I don't know if you have looked at it or not. But uh, now, to, like, I think to them, I don't know I mean, how much do I want to cut, but I think in terms of fame, like MIT became number one now, and alone. So uh, like, what is special about MIT? What is unique about MIT? Is there like a very fierce competition? I have been there, I can add to that, but I think you have exactly. been both as a student and faculty, so we can tell more about that. Uh, sure, uh, so again, I think all the rank, as much as I'm happy about MIT being the undisputed number one, I think all of these rankings could be taken with a big grain of salt. So, so, so that's so that's one thing. Again, even if the like 
what does it mean that the university is great? In the end, you end up as a graduate student, you end up working with a particular faculty. And, you know, maybe the, like, you know, it's in, in the end, your story can differ quite a bit from the average story. So again, just a disclaimer there. Now, in terms of MIT, and again, Mohammed, you can definitely, like you are as, you know, as uh, in good position as I to speak about that. Is so, if I said, what is unique about MIT, at least unique to me again, which means I have been to many other top places, but I was for a short period of time. So I really might not be familiar. And I definitely, there are the great institutions I have not been to. But like the thing that is unique to me at MIT is the energy. Like it is a place, especially pre-pandemic, unfortunately pandemic has its impact is that whenever I come into office, I feel this energy buzzing in the air. Like people are around, they are thinking kind of like things are happening and kind of this energy really, you know, I charge of this energy. So I come into the office and I'm actually, actually getting much more excited about doing whatever I do. Like kind of you feel really empowered to do stuff. So this is kind of, again, it of course has, you know, excellent faculty, excellent, absolutely brilliant students, but this is true about many other top institutions. But like, this is the thing that at MIT, there is a culture of coming to the office and working in the office. Like there are other places that kind of have a culture of actually, it's not a cool thing to be in the office, but like at MIT, like people come to the office and this contributes is really this energy that I find very unique about, uh, about MIT. Now, in terms of competition, like I know that this is the kind of the vibe that people think that MIT has, is very competitive. I would say that it is yes and no. Okay, so actually I was somewhat competitive. I felt competitive when I was a student at MIT, but this competitiveness was coming from myself. It was about me being very ambitious and kind of, you know, seeing all these great people around me doing all this great stuff. And, oh, I want to kind of, I don't want to be the imposter syndrome. So I, I, just to give you an anecdote, and, you know, Mohammed, you will know perfectly, like, I came in as this, like, first year students, a student from, you know, from, uh, you know, from Poland, you know, and then, like, we have, like, a get together for the students to get to know students. And then there's a student coming in to me, and it's, you know, it's Mihai Patraszko. Uh, and, you know, and asking, so yeah, so we had this discussion saying, and say, okay, I've got to go because I need to work on my Fox submissions or, or whatever, saying, okay, so first of all, and I didn't know who he is, and saying, okay, I knew that he was the second year student at that time, and like, he had Fox submission, but actually it was not one submission, it was like five submissions, yes. uh, and then you look at his webpage, and he has already papers in undergrad, like Stock and Fox papers, so yeah. it's very hard not to get immediate imposter signal, uh, syndrome because of that. Like he's by the, he was, by the way, unfortunately he tragically uh, died, but like, you know, he was the, the most generous person in the world and completely, completely like kind of, you know, like very kind of very jovial and so on. But like you internally saying, oh my God, if this is the bar, I really need to get my kind of, you know, my, my, my kind of act together. Of course, I then realized that Mihai was not even by MIT standards, he was not a typical, uh, typical uh, kind of case. So, you know, my imposter sy syndrome went a bit down, but this is what's happening. It's kind of, you have all these people who are really excited about their work. And like you say, okay, like I just clearly, like I need to, I'm very high and all the competitiveness comes from that. I, I literally never have seen any external competitiveness happening here, even as a faculty, when we talk about the students, like that's not the, like we're not saying, okay, is this person better or this person better? Like, it's more about, you know, we want to help students to be excellent in whatever excellent means for them. And yeah, I, I just know, like, I just kind of, the only time when you really feel competitiveness and I did feel competitiveness, like external competitiveness was uh, on the job market. That was the only time where really kind of, you know, you know that it is you versus them in some ways, even though, you know, everyone just tries to like, you know, there's like every candidate wants to get a good job and that's nothing about them, but you knew that you were compared against other candidates, sometimes, you know, head to head, but this is not about MIT. This is about the nature of the process. So, so, so this is my message. So again, in some ways I felt competitive at MIT, but it was really an internal competitiveness, not external one. Yeah, good. I think two points that you have mentioned, I can add to that. So one thing about, uh, like, I think that is clearly the case that like anytime that you will come, especially to CSAIL, like the, somehow the heart of theory and other parts of like MIT East, yes, I will say, you will see people there. And that is one thing that was unique because I was post like after that at CMU and CMU again, what number one now, according to you know, this number two again, you are joking about it. But uh, yeah, I think like it's like a very tough school CMU as well, but uh, I didn't see that much professor like after 5 p.m. 
That was, I think, the difference that they have seen it at MIT versus other. That I, I remember that, I mean, like, I was there, like, until even 8 p.m. sometime it was there. It, during the deadline, I, I mentioned, actually, this one deadline, me and Eric Demain were leaving. That was a five deadline when I was a student. Around something like midnight or one, I think maybe one or two a.m. even. And then at that time, we left the office. The deadline was, I think, the day after or, like, or something like this. And then at that time, Piotr Indica actually was coming back. I said, okay, how did you say that? Oh, actually, I had my just my dinner. I'm coming back to work on my Fox submission. And again, Fox, Soda, and just like these are the top theory conferences that we mentioned in this talk, in case you heard about it. That's one thing. The other one, actually, great thing that you mentioned, and this, is, this pressure from yourself, is I think that's probably the most promoting thing that can happen in your life. As you mentioned, like nobody, there are two ways that, I mean, somebody comes to you and says that you should work hard or something like this from external things. But really that does not happen. The only thing is yourself. You just see these people and you see that like I'm here, I need to mean not, I mean, compete with, and don't say compete. You don't want to be below the bar for these people. You want to be like in par with them. And that's the one that actually gives you and gives and give lots of motivation for you to work very hard. And that's actually an interesting thing. And I think that is totally fine. Like, if somebody else forces you, I think that's not maybe right things. Like, I should maybe not do that one for my children. Or, but if I, this comes from my inside, I think that's actually a great motivation. But that, I think that's a great thing that you mentioned. Uh, great. So I think we can uh, talk about uh, MIT and other stuff also for a long time, but let's go a, a little bit more about the, like the research stuff. And again, these are really nice topics. We can maybe talk more about this type of uh, this in the future live or something like this. Uh, but uh, good. So uh, you worked, uh, I mean, both in the, as we discussed, so you had a background from computer science. You wanted to write games, essentially, maybe. <laughs> then you changed, I mean, you have done more theoretical computer science. At the same time, you had background in theoretical physics. Then you go and you were a theory student, I mean, theory student, like theoretical computer science. We talked about it before. Uh, lots of this actually is one of the foundational areas in computer science is theoretical computer science. And you had excellent papers, some of them that got best paper award in top uh, CS theory conferences like Soda Fox. And then at some point you decided that you want to do more ML and machine learning. So how was uh, that? Why you decided to do that? And do you still enjoy it? Was it the correct decision? Not? Yeah, tell us more about that. Okay, yeah. So, so indeed, you know, I always tell my students that, like, you know, academic career in research is really like a random walk with a field. So, yeah, so you roughly kind of, you know, there's a general direction in which you want to pursue, but then there are things happen that kind of change uh, the trajectory quite a bit. So if you kind of kept asking me during my whole career, starting with, you know, I guess with high school, you know, what I will be doing in four years, from now or five years from now, I probably would be failing this test each time, like at every year you ask me, right? So again, going into undergrad, I thought I would be programming games. <laughs> That's not what I did. Even when I was applying to MIT and I was getting in, I was saying, I will work on quantum cryptography with Silvio Micali. Well, turned out that Silvio Micali was not interested in quantum cryptography and neither was I because I realized, oh, there are these cool algorithms there and that's what I want to do. So kind of that's what I did for a PhD. And I guess then, you know, even during PhD, like it was kind of, I discovered continuous optimization. That was kind of also something that I got really excited in. So, you know, long story short is that like, I always view uh, doing research as a journey. Actually, like, this is why we have the freedom we have of like, you know, of being a faculty or being students. It's like, we really, you know, we are underpaid, but one thing we get is the freedom of pursuing whatever passion that like, is kind of great to us. And especially as a faculty, you discover it's not only like this inspiration is not only come from the like talks you see and kind of and what you like what you read, but also from your students. And actually like, your students become a big driver of your interest because they just come up with some interesting ideas. They go, oh, hmm, actually, this is interesting. So this is kind of the general background. So I never was too set 
in the kind of in you know in okay this is the thing i will be doing till the end of my life i always did what i really found impactful and exciting to me and also things i actually could do right like there are many things that i find exciting and important and unfortunately for for better or worse i'm not i don't seem to be very good at uh, but okay so uh, you know, so yeah, so actually, I'm just thinking about this. Just, I started with like working on logics in computer science, then complexity, computational complexity, then working on cryptography, then working on algorithms, uh, and you know, and so on. Actually, in the meantime, I also was doing approximation algorithms. So, anyway, so I was just going in the hierarchy lower and lower and lower. Uh, and you know, kind of now, I guess I'm doing much, much more applied stuff too. So, okay, so how did I, my journey with ML started? So, again, I don't know, it was like 2015, 2016. So that's where I joined MIT. Kind of, of course, no, you could not kind of open the fridge there without hearing about ML and deep learning. But, you know, what it is to me, theoretician, this, you know, yet another buzz. Why would I care? There was, you know, this buzz, other buzz, it will pass, you know, that's fine. I will be doing my beautiful graph algorithms. But then there was a talk, I think it was by Yann Lacun in kind of, he gave a talk at MIT and I said, okay, well, you know, like this guy is famous, I heard. So let's see what, what, what he's got. And, there was and he lived in the Turing Award as well. Yeah, but it was way before that. But even then he already was famous. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, so that's why kind of, I just said, okay, like, let's just go and, and listen. And just an interesting talk. Uh, but the thing that struck me saying that the things that he was talking about, you know, oh, uh, what, you know, uh, what uh, machine learning needs uh, it's kind of, oh, you know, like I see connections to theory, to theoretical concepts that like, that seem to be at least, uh, you know, kind of at the surface relevant to what he was talking about. Like, I think this is about the randomness and other aspects. So, you know, I was talking to like Shafi, Goldwasser and other things about this, and it was just a conversation. But then I kind of, my students, right, they also got kind of interested in this. And I don't know who even proposed it, but there was like just a book at that time that came up. It's just like about deep learning, uh, you know, uh, by Bengio, Gold, uh, Goodfellow and, and others. And, you know, like just we said, okay, so let's do a reading group in which we just like read this, read this book kind of, and just like learn what this whole deep learning stuff is about. So we did, like I said, okay, that's actually, again, after this talk by uh, Jan Lacroon, uh, I thought that there is it's an interesting question, so let's do it. So we started doing it. And then we realized that like, based on reading this book is that there's not that much known about like why deep learning works, kind of how to kind of this, what I later would call science of deep learning was really in infancy. Like people had some conjectures, had some intuitions, but it was very clear that there was not much in terms of sound uh, kind of, you know, uh, like real, like, okay, we know this is the hypothesis. These are the experiments that confirm this hypothesis or refute it. And that's kind of how we build that. It was more like, these are intuitions, this seems to work. And again, again, people were still like, this was a very new field. People were advancing stuff. It was just like, they were trying to explore the, the frontier. So, you know, I'm not, it, it's not meant to criticize anyone, just like natural thing when there's a new area, but that's what happened. So we said, okay, so that's interesting. And then we realized that there is this thing called like adversarial robustness, which maybe we can talk about later. And just, and you know, we realized, okay, actually, you know, like, okay, so we, I think we understand the problem correctly. But like, why are not these people thinking about this problem in this way, like essentially in terms of optimization? And if you think about this in optimization, then if you want to get the adversarial robust models, what you should do is you should just do this like natural algorithm. And then we got curious, okay, does it work? And essentially my students said, okay, it's not me. My students said, okay, so let's, let's try it, right? So, and, and so, so essentially like what happens, I told them, okay, you know, I'm actually, I'm happy to try, but you know, if we are doing it, we need to do it for real. So I will buy GPUs. You need to learn how to program these GPUs. And then we try to evaluate, you know, implement this uh, idea and see what happens, right? And, and that's what happened, you know, kind of they did it and it turned out to be to work. Uh, and, you know, and that's kind of, you, know, you could say the rest is history. Like in some ways, okay, so you had this actually, this is now my most cited paper, uh, in kind of uh, the resulting paper is like the, my most cited paper uh, by now. Uh, just kind of the, that came out of this, you know, out of the action. This was our first paper about deep learning. And of course, you know, you know and we realized that we really enjoy that, like that kind of this trying to understand this empirical phenomena, but coming with a, like a theory mindset, like trying to think of definition of like how to conceptually, uh, you know, uh, conceptually uh, capture them. Like that was, seemed to be something we really enjoyed. 
And again, my students in particular were willing to put time and effort to run the large scale experiments to learn all this engineering that goes into it. And, you know, and, and that's like, yeah, at this point, then some of my students switch from being a theory students to become machine learning students. Then you start getting, attracting new students who just want to do machine learning with you. They are not interested in theory. And that's kind of, you know, so in some ways I can say, I commanded this move, which is to some extent true, but on some extent it was like, you are moved by your students, you know, kind of in that direction. And so, so, so that's how where I end up, ended up where I am. And I am tremendously enjoying it. Like, I, I think this is like really a kind of, you know, a domain in which one can has a lot of impact that is still a lot of really exciting questions uh, kind of uh, that, you know, one can identify and resolve. So that's actually most of my time is, is, is spent by that. And again, this is the pleasure of being a faculty. Like if you do something you don't enjoy, well, you should just do something else because you have a freedom to do that. Like no one, no one tells you what to do here. Uh, good, great. Actually, you mentioned a few points that I have written down I want to mention. So that, and these are like a great point that I reach exactly the same thing. So I was talking actually with my brother. He's at Microsoft. Uh, I mean, he's doing some research there, and I think now he has a group. And he was saying, I mean, like, how do you feel about, like, you are a professor at the university. You may, I mean, the money that you may get, it might be less than your, I mean, PhD student that just graduates and goes to this top company. And, like, after a few years, actually, it might be, I don't know, one-fourth of the people, if that person goes, like, for five years, possibly they can get much more. How do you feel about it? I think these two, and I'm not thinking about it, because this is something that you need to answer. And these two points that you mentioned, I think, are ex exactly the points that I came to that. One, essentially, flexibility. Because I, like, I like your approach, and I have done the same thing. Also, I have done, like, for example, different type of algorithms, you know, I, I have done from embedding, uh, going to, I don't know, a streaming, map reduce. Now I'm working also on some uh, machine learning and stuff. I have done also lots of these things. And this could not, or like fixed parameter algorithm actually at the beginning, this could not happen if I was like in industry because there they restrict, I mean, somehow there is some restrictions that you cannot go beyond that. Unless I don't know, no, there are like the Bell Labs maybe or Microsoft Research. They were, even there, I think I was there like as an intern there. There are some limitations in industry. At uh, like at uh, academia, you can actually choose what you want to work on it. And you think it is nice, you want to learn about it, you will go and learn about it. And the second one that is actually is very important, also the students. I, like, uh, I think you had also like a great, uh, like lots of great students. And I had also lots of great students that I'm actually very proud that I worked with them. I think that was very important for me that I can work with such excellent people because that, that is totally different from like, yes, of course, I mean, you might have some people under you in this company that they are excellent. Not all the time happens or like if you are in a research center happens. Sometimes when you are in the company, you need to just do the job of the, I mean, the work of the company. And in that sense, it does not necessarily mean that the people under you are the best or the people that you can enjoy, I mean, learning a lot from them. This was a unique opportunity for me to work with such excellent students. And I think I'm very proud of it. And that is not something that you can easily find. Maybe some rare places it can happen in industrial research labs, but not everywhere. So I think that's, these are two important things that you mentioned that these are like actually very important about academia versus industry for me. Yes, you may get less money, maybe much less. But much, much, less money, much less money, much less money. It was not like that. I, uh, but uh, I think it has changed, you know, the whole world. Uh, and another thing that you mentioned actually that was also interesting. Now, we were talking about theoretical computer science and we design algorithms. We we make proofs. I think that's the main difference. What's the meaning of theoretical computer science? It means that we are proving the things that we are saying versus the other areas that they may not prove. Of course, I mean, there are some evidence for that, but this evidence are not necessarily proof. Proof means it should be correct all the time. Evidence means that with this data that I'm using, that shows, I mean, my algorithm is better than that. Doesn't mean that if there is a particular data for some particular data, my algorithm might be worse than the previous month. That does not exclude such kind of things, unless there is a proof for that. Now, uh, at the same time, uh, this is the 
issue that you mentioned about the citations. Like, I think this paper that you had it, I think about adversarial uh, uh, attack, actually got the most uh, cited, your, your most cited paper. And you had at the same time very excellent theory papers that they got the best paper ever. But they may not get that much citations. How do you feel? These are, and I, I would say that actually, that somehow papers like the students are like your children. So which one you like the most? And I mean, how do you feel about them? I mean, <laughs> okay, that's an unfair question. That's exactly like if you ask a parent, like which uh, which uh, ch uh, child do you love the most? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so okay. So just to get back to one point that you made, because I I agree with it completely, is exactly like the pleasure of working with students. Like you know, again, let's be very clear. Like being a faculty is not always just like you know great things and like you know intellectual pursuit. There's a lot of kind of grind and like things that you just need to deal with. And so it's overwhelming, but it's always that, you know, each time I have a meeting with a student, I just have the realization, oh, yes, that's why I'm a, a faculty, like just to have this really, really brilliant people. But if I wanted to have these brilliant people, like comparably brilliant people in industry, I would need to be a CEO of a great company and like work like crazy to attract them. Here they come, not only they come, they want to work with you and they are really open to interacting with you and so on. And this is like a great privilege. And I really cannot express in my word like like the brilliance of my students and kind of how invigorating uh, and kind of motivating this is. It's kind of, it's hard to uh, overestimate that. So this is just one point. Now, yeah, the citations are silly. Like, let's be very clear about this. You know, again, ML, especially deep learning and the type of stuff that's it's just like super hot. And so, you know, like, I don't think, you know, we should really like equate the number of citations for my theory papers with the number of citations uh, for, you know, for my, uh, you know, kind of machine learning papers. I think my machine learning papers, like the most cited, probably most cited of some of the, you know, absolutely biggest hits in theory. Yes, again, and I'm not saying at all that they're at the same level scientifically. It's, I'm just saying is that there is a clearly a normalization problem. So it was a little bit of a bittersweet situation where you saw this paper, you know, kind of just go up and just like quickly overtake all of these other papers that I'm extremely proud of in, in theory. And, you know, by now, I think my first theory paper is number 10 or something, yes? And I definitely don't think that my theory papers are outside of my top 10 of the papers I wrote. So, you know, again, I similarly, as I don't have a favorite students, I also don't have a favorite papers, but there are definitely papers that I'm really proud of. I'm actually really proud of the adversary robustness paper, um, but I'm also proud of like, of the whole work on the maximum flow paper uh, work. Like I just, you know, it's not only about the result, like, and again, there's a personal aspect to it. It's something I really wanted to, to crack and I managed to crack it with a lot of personal uh, kind of satisfaction from that. But I think that it was really important to kind of act in this like new way of thinking about algorithms, using unit optimization that I think, you know, took root. And since then, like there are actually like, you know, tremendous and humbling progress uh, afterwards. And kind of, you can see, you know, it gives you, okay, you know, there is, by the way, there recently there was a, you know, a really amazing result of getting like, you know, nearly linear time or like close to linear time max flow result for like exact, which is, you know, this is the holy grail in the space. So again, in some ways I wish I do that, but to be honest, like, you know, the next best thing saying, I look at the paper and I see a lot of my papers are cited there. So I can at least claim, okay, I helped this happen. Again, again, I'm not saying, I would prefer to be the one who does this paper, but you know, in absence of that, uh, you know, uh, this was great. So, so I really, I'm really proud of that work and I really, really cherish kind of, it was like extremely exciting to do it. But yeah, over time, you know, it's yeah, like at this point it's at least like three or four lines of works or works, particular work that I really am proud of. And kind of each one of them is this kind of, you know, a spike of excitement and seeing, okay, this is so cool. You are so happy with, you know, what happened here and so on and so on. So, so I don't, I don't want even to choose to try to pick, but definitely like the max flow results are the ones that I, you know, are very, very close to my heart. Yeah, that, that I can completely imagine. Especially I think that uh, solo paper that you had, like you were the only author of that paper. But I think the best paper award, uh, uh, yeah. As well, and uh, yeah, that like I think it was in the circle of folks that got the best paper award. Yeah, I think these are some of the things that when I see also my theory versus non theory thing, I mean, see, like, this paper we got lots of citations, but I know, like, I just spend more ideas in this other paper. Maybe the, I mean, <laughs> the people I mean, didn't get that much citation, but maybe I mean, the, the people didn't spend time to understand it. Yeah. 
at least until now, maybe for, hopefully it happens in the future. Yeah, this citation is another game essentially that, uh, I mean, unfortunately, sometimes it happens when we uh, uh, discuss with other faculties as well. And like this, you cannot just see that one. Yes, the theory paper may not get that many citations, but not that many people in the world actually understand the thing it is mentioned. Yeah. Versus like, yes, I mean, some of this uh, thing that we will talk about this machine learning, like one trick, I think that was these things, this kind of deactivation that you consider the a deep net and you deactivate some of them with some probabilities. And these people like, got lots of citations because they decided, okay, we just randomly deactivate that. But lots of citations maybe had actually practical impact as well, but there was not much deep ideas there. Uh, of yes. course, there might be some other papers that they have deep ideas and they are theory, but anyhow. So I yes, so, think that the citation is another nice thing that we can it, do it's, and it's a more library. But let's go actually to yeah, some think, of these things that you uh, mentioned. I think uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, deep learning. Uh, and so uh, I think we will go back to the theory. So in theory, you have work on the network flow. And I mean, in some sense, network flow and deep nets are not that much different from each other. These are both networks that the information goes from one to other. Of course, there are some kind. Yeah, there are some lots of similarities. How do you feel about them, like about network flow and then deep learning? And what is the, like the, can you give us like a very good intuition or the intuition that you have about the deep nets comparing to the graphs in similar problems? It's an interesting perspective. I actually never thought about Sorry, I don't hear you well now. Oh, I see. Uh, uh, let me. Can, can you like? I think everything is fine on my end. Uh, do you hear me? Well, let me just just let me just change this one to the uh, Do you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, th that sounds good. Yes, you go ahead. Okay, okay. So, so, so that's an interesting that's an interesting perspective. I actually never thought about this this way. So that's interesting to hear that that's how you think about this. So, to me, uh, like kind of, there is definitely an optimization uh, view on uh, deep learning that I kind of that was to me the connection that like yes, you know, you you look for maximum flow by solving uh, optimization problem by gradient descent. And here you are kind of, you know, fitting the neural network to data is also done by gradient descent. But like, actually that's where my really intuitions in that regard kind of, uh, or the parallels really stopped. Uh, you know, my thinking was that, yeah, essentially, okay, so I never, so, okay. So, so this was, the, this was the thing is that uh, kind of was, uh, like I spend a lot of time thinking about this, exactly like how to how to think of deep neural networks, and again you can try to go into you know depth of like mechanics of like yeah how exactly the activations are propagated, how they are aggregated, and how they flow, but somehow I realized at some point at least like made the decision that this is where madness lies. Like kind of if you start trying to under like you know try to reverse engineer it, you will just get lost. Like the complexity of this is so great that like I just don't know how to harness it again. There are people who can do that and they are very successful, but like, you know, at first people were like just proving things for like two layer network, but over time, the R result is actually generalized too much more. So there is, again, that's a triumph of theory to me because it shows that once again, once you can start thinking about very complex things in a kind of, a, you know, a principled way and kind of understand that. But like, I actually like, beyond the, there is just one work, which is like the batch norm work where we kind of try to understand a bit what's happening between different layers and kind of understanding how the distribution of activations. Uh, uh, sorry, just one thing. Actually, it, 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 I think it, it disconnects us in Instagram after one hour, like in 18 seconds. So I think I will just go out, just takes one minute, such that I will save this one and then we will come back and we will continue. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, uh, thanks, yeah.
Do you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, great. Uh, sorry, yes, like, yeah. Instagram, like, Zoom, and I got your uh, one hour they disconnect us. And uh, great. So we are back. And I needed to save this one because if I don't save it, it will be gone. So I need to put a title, etc. That's the one that takes like one minute uh, to do that. Uh, great. So uh, I think we were talking about uh, like a theory versus ML. And then and we are talking about mm -hmm. uh, MIT. Uh, and uh, this, uh, like, uh, the connection between like the work that he was doing, like about the flow and graph, network flow and uh, deep learning. So do you want to maybe just give maybe a few, just maybe very short thing, uh, um, short uh, definitions of network flow for the people who are not in the field, maybe in the high level, as well as deep network, and then we can go more and discuss the discussion that we had. Sure. Uh, okay. So, yeah. So what is network flow? So essentially like network flow, like you're thinking of a graph that, you know, let's think that it's a directed graph. So essentially you have nodes uh, and then edges can go one or the other direction. And then uh, what you are thinking about is a situation in which each of these edges has a positive number, which is capacity. So think of edges representing, I guess, one directional pipes that have certain rate of flow that each of them can uh, support. And now we have two special nodes in the network, which is like the source node and the sync node, usually denoted by S and T. And what you are asking is say, saying, okay, what is the maximum rate of flow that I can route in this network from S to T, while of course observing all of the rate constraints of particular uh, edges, okay? So that's kind of roughly the, the question again, you know, Clearly it has applications if you are trying to, you know, to manage some kind of, you know, uh, system of like, you know, of uh, sending water or oil. Uh, but actually it turns out that this problem can end up being very fundamental. And a lot of other like cut problems and planning problems can actually be reduced to the question I, I, of I think, this. I think the, the, network, the internet actually is based on that in some sense as well. Yes, it is, you know, there are generalization of this question when you have also costs for sending things and so on. And yes, so internet in particular, like, you know, it's definitely, you know, this is a way of trying to estimate, you know, the rate of traffic between, you know, between uh, two nodes, although it gets a bit uh, complicated because, you know, the data behaves a bit differently and you can do something called network coding and kind of do some tricks that uh, kind of that uh, go beyond what just thinking of uh, sending water via pipes would give you, but definitely is a very useful primitive in analyzing the structure of the network and so on. So that's the network flow. So what deep learning is really, it's kind of, is a way of doing machine learning using particular type of models, namely models, which essentially consist of like a sequence of operations that are called layers, where you are kind of, you know, applying, well, you start with some input, right? Which you can view as just the set of numbers. You can think of activations. Then you are kind of mixing these inputs. Again, this is a very, this is the most basic version. This is called the so-called fully, uh, fully connected network in which you kind of combine kind of, essentially you have, you map your initial activations to the new set of activations by essentially kind of mixing, you know, new activation mixes all of the previous activations with different weights. Okay, so that's how you get from one activation layer to another activation layer. And then you apply, this is very important, you apply to each of the activations some kind of non-linearity. Usually now it's a rare, rare thing. So essentially something that, you know, kind of it's, uh, you know, if it's number is smaller than zero, it becomes zero. If it's, you know, if it's uh, kind of, if it's larger than zero, then it's just this number, it's just identity. So kind of- you It's a value function, function, correct? Yeah, it's a value function. So, you know, essentially, and you just like keep combining these layers. And again, I'm, there is, you know, the reality is much more complicated for, for, for a variety of reasons, but like this is the basic idea that you keep combining these layers. And essentially what it means to train such a network is to figure out by gradient descent, what are the weights with which you are mixing uh, kind of this activation at each of the layers, okay? And so that's kind of, you know, again, this is a very, very simplified uh, picture of what deep learning is about. It's about kind of learning, so essentially learning how to uh, predict, you know, from, you know, from input features, 
uh, predict a label using this kind of models. And you know, the point is that deep learning was first proposed way back, like you know, I know in the 60s so, or something like that. And you know, there was a lot of excitement about that uh, approach at first, but let's just say it didn't deliver what people hoped to deliver. So that then there was so-called AI winter based on that. And there is, there's more nuance to the stories, but let's yes. not go there. And then there was a resurgence of, of deep learning, you know, with uh, like the most, uh, well, in the 2012 paper, like so-called image paper by, you know, by, um, um, uh, you know, uh, like, well, it involved like, so, uh, so it's, an, it's an Alexnet paper, not image paper, it's an Alexnet paper that showed that certain, you know, one can uh, achieve way, way, way better performance than anything else on certain vision, uh, uh, vision, uh, computer vision challenge called ImageNet. Using yeah, this, so you know, year that? So, so AlexNet was, I, I believe, 2012. Uh, so, uh, yes. I think there was something also about uh, this uh, kinds of, uh, was it, uh, that one was the first or the other one that, uh, for voice recognition, that was yes, not... Uh, so, so that's what I'm saying, that like it didn't exactly, people say that the, well, in some ways revolution started with the Alexa paper because it really like after that, you know, the whole computer vision just shifted to deep learning and, that, and then everyone followed. But yeah, there were successes already earlier. So actually, like, if you think, I think even in the 90s, you know, Lekun has some interesting digit, uh, like a recognition kind of handwritten digit recognition system based on deep learning. But yeah, at that time, people were still skeptical. Even for this like earlier, I think 2006, maybe 2008, 2010, there were papers on speech recognition with deep learning uh, that I think Hinton was involved and maybe Benji was involved in some of them. Uh, but like it was, you know, the people in the area knew that this is something new happening, but it was not yet widespread. And only the like the Alex that paper really kind of, you know, made everyone convince everyone that, okay, this is, this is it, this is the future. And, and kind of the rest is history. That kind of, it's, it's for some reason, these models end up being, you know, despite seemingly being like crazy in some ways, because we don't know anything about why things converge, whether they converge, what they converge to, somehow they just seem to work. And again, by now we didn't see much more about like why they work, but still I wouldn't say that we really understand why they work. But you know, the, the point was that like, you know, now essentially every area of machine learning kind of uses deep learning uh, because they realize that like, for some reason, the type of representations that you are getting with these models are just way better than anything else. Like that in some ways, the point there is that these models learn the best way to represent data, which makes the machine learning problems, you know, kind of easier to solve. And in some ways, machine learning is about finding the best way to represent data. Yeah. Actually, I think I want to add something. So I ask you specifically to, I mean, like define uh, this network flow and then deep learning. I think I really meant for that because for me, like from the expert, you may hear something that like uh, you may read, I don't know, 10 papers or even more, 10 videos, and you don't get that point. I think there are a few of these examples that happened to me and that's the thing that I learned actually when you describe some new vision that really come to me that this is the case. And this is one other thing also like about this live because you may add actually into our knowledge of it. But one thing, for example, it was like, uh, I was in Simon's uh, workshop and this was the talk that Christos Pomodimitrio was giving. I was reading a lot of papers about SVM, like support vector machines and the difference between this and linear, like a regression. I didn't quite understand what's the meaning of like, the, I mean, of course I knew about formula about kernels, but I didn't know what is the exact thing. He actually mentioned one, like one sentence that I got the whole idea. What was the idea? I think that might be like, you already know that, but it was interesting that he mentioned, actually, when you try to do the linear regression, if we have some kind of, say blue points here and red points here, then we will have some kind of linear regression that say these are blue and this is red and you can just train it and you learn. <laughs> However, if you have some kind of a red inside blue, in that case, actually what you can do, you cannot find any line to do that. The way is that you need to have some function that brings these blue ones essentially out of the plane with some things and then keep the red one on the plane and then you have a, uh, like uh, a page or like, I don't know, a hyper a plane, a plane that can separate them. That one gave me a lot of, I mean, 
understanding what's the meaning of the kernel. I could see the papers, and maybe the people even that have written those papers at the beginning, they didn't have such a thing. Maybe they had, or didn't mention it, or maybe I didn't read it carefully. But these are like a great thing that you can only get it from the people who work in this area. And these are like maybe one sentence. Like from the, the old talk, I think I don't remember lots of other parts, but just this sentence was a lot for me that I learned because I couldn't learn it from several other papers. So that's the thing that we will go and I think we will get your, uh, I mean, from the uh, case that we have, we try to get uh, something maybe in the, like a reg the language for the regular people, but they can g learn a lot for that. I learned a lot for that. I'm sure that others will get it as well. Good. So we talk about uh, deep learning and this uh, network uh, flow. Or So the question is that, uh, like the graph uh, thing. So we discussed that, I mean, deep learning, we have several layers. Then the question is that generally, I mean, when you try to train this one, you will put a complete network between them. So uh, uh, do you think that the network has any effect on that or really those functions that we are putting, ReLU and others, that's the thing that is more important for deep learning. Well, both do. Like, well, first of all, you know, yeah. So what I just defined is just like this fully connected layer. But the truth is that no one, well, not no one, but like you rarely use like fully connected layer alone. Like, like essentially like this is this architecture is the easiest to explain, but not the one that is used. And that is for two reasons. First of all, such a, kind of, you know, such a network has like many parameters because it has like, you know, a quadratic number of uh, weights uh, per layer. And that's quite a lot actually. So that's one reason. The other reason is that kind of in some ways, you know, uh, you would like to have networks that have some particular so-called prior encoded into them. So in particular, you know, when you talk about images, right? So what you would like to express is some very simple properties, sym symmetry of data that would be very hard for the model to need to see many samples to learn it by itself is that, okay, if I trying to recognize an object in the picture, if I move this object a bit over the picture, this should not matter. Like essentially like if I have an object and I move it a little bit, it's the same object. And that's of course something that's obvious to us because we evolve the way that our brain understand this. But you know, a priori, the computer will not, like the, this network will not understand that. So you would like to somehow encourage it to realize that there are these symmetries. And again, if you try to do it with a fully connected neural network of sufficient size that to even to be able to solve this problem, you will require a lot of samples to just make such a simple fact come across. Uh, so what people kind of use is in particular con convolutional neural networks, which are di which have a very different set of connection. Again, they're in the end equivalent to some particular structure of the fully connected network, but it's just the one that essentially uses like kind of convolutions and essentially like, essentially like the way the signal is aggregated is by just like, you can think of this as just, you know, shifting a window through your image and kind of pulling and, you know, usually average pulling, like kind of averaging the signal that you are getting in. So I don't want to go into detail. This is actually quite an, you know, uh, quite an exquisite construction that, you know, took a while to, to come up. It was kind of uh, inspired by the brain a bit. But the point is that like, you know, when you, in computer vision, you always use either uh, this convolutional neural network or something now called uh, transformers that kind of, you know, it's a, a, a different architecture. Like the point is that just like letting these connections be like arbitrary, this just doesn't work. So, so, so it's always, so there's a big impact on like what kind of connections we, we come up with. And in particular, one of the big advances was like very simple innovation, but like something called residual connections in which you kind of have a kind of a bypassing connection also that kind of just propagates the signal across layers without the mixing. These are the so-called residual layers and kind of resonance. And that was a big advancement. So definitely this, uh, you know, uh, this uh, kind of this structure matters. Having said that initially, as you already mentioned, there was quite a bit of excitement about different activation functions and people claim, oh, this activation function is better and better. But I think by now this mostly stabilized and essentially now everyone uses ReLU and they still innovate on the kind of on the architecture side, on the kind of connection side or how many layers, transformer, no transformer, there are some new advances, but like, I think everyone settled now 
on uh, on Reduce, and they, they seem to be just working uh, well enough. And um, uh, so, so yeah, so I would say that the structure is definitely what you know what seems to be more important. Yeah. So actually, uh, let me have you say my understanding from this. So I think uh, we will uh, talk about that. We have several layers, and of course, the simplest one is that the complete network that you will use, a complete bipartite graph. Everyone is connected. But as you mentioned, I mean, when you consider this uh, kind of uh, convolution or like this kind of transfer transformers that we are doing, in some sense, these are the graph structure. We don't have this complete bipartite graph anymore. We have this, each of these nodes is only connected to some certain neighborhood, and based on that, it activates. So that's essentially one layer that the, the graph would be not a complete bipartite graph, but we have different nodes that are connected to different neighbors. And I think you mentioned even this, you may still consider it as a layered graph, but the other one that you mentioned, the people observe that even just having all the layers and all the edges between the layers is not consecutive layers, is not enough. You might have by path, maybe from one layer, you will go to other one. And you have such a, comp and yes, essentially you, you have a graph, I mean, in that sense. The question is that how you can describe this graph in a simple way that you can architect it or like you can build it. I think that's my understanding from the way that the people think about this. Yes, yeah, so, so there definitely is a question how to propagate the information from like between layers. And again, there's a lot of innovation. So in particular transformers, which is now seems to be dominant uh, kind of architecture is quite clever about that because in some ways it just, you know, uh, well, essentially it uses Okay, so, so, so there, are actually, actually, so there are kind of two dimensions of propagating information. It's across layers and also across input, like from different parts of the input. Like if you have an image or something, or, or actually more importantly, text. You know, how do you make sure that the presence of the word towards the end of the, ses the sentence informs maybe your way of reading the beginning of the sentence or something like that? So kind of, so that's another like big thing. So. So in particular, yes, so for the propagation of information, there are this kind of, you know, ResNet, and there are also different uh, networks that kind of, you know, try to generalize this idea to like, or maybe you also skip many layers, or you have different edges skipping different number of layers, uh, and so on, and there are kind of a uh, connection there, but then there are also transformers which kind of try to learn this kind of attention, which is really like, which part of the activations do you kind of mix with which part of activation kind of you, you make it much more focused as opposed to just like a fully connected thing. So there's a lot of thinking there. The, and this is actually quite clever. I think the, from the theory point of view, the less, you know, the less satisfying aspect of that is that essentially like it's all learned, meaning there is some magic happening that decides from which parts you, you are reading. And it's like, so it's not like, like this is by the way, the mantra of deep learning is that you don't try to explicitly specify anything too much. We kind of give it uh, many degrees of freedom and you let the data uh, decide, you know, what is during the training, what is the right way to tune parameters. So this is kind of maybe a bit unsatisfying for people like us who kind of like to define the structure of the graph is that like, you know, like you, you, do, you, you have very limited way of doing it because the conventional wisdom seems to be that you want to intervene as little as possible, that kind of, you know, it's better to learn than to try to fix things ahead of time, because in some ways, you know, our understanding of what are the right architectural priors, essentially it's relatively limited and we are more likely to break things than think, fix things by, by doing that. So, but, but yeah, so, but there definitely is a thinking about that. I, I think again, it's less so than it used to be, but there's still some innovation happening on this front. I think another one or so that is related, I probably don't want to go there, but we mentioned all this, Friends, essentially, like friend topic. I think we should also mention we should also mention uh, auto encoders. I think that's another interesting thing that I think that people are using it. But if you consider the graph, they try to learn something, and in the middle of the graph, some information which is somehow like uh, computed by some nodes that you will consider as the embedding. I think this has been used, for example, for word to bake and other stuff that the people are using it a lot in practice as well. And that's another thing. Do you want to add anything for autoencoder as well, the view that you have it with? Oh yeah, so, so I mean, it's a kind of a, a little bit different beast, right? Because it's not really about trying to predict data per se. It's about trying to find a better compression of data. 
kind of a better representation of data. So yeah. essentially, like the question is, oh, you know, normally, like when we think, okay, how do I represent? I have a potentially universe of inputs or some distribution of inputs that I might want to represent succinctly. So, you know, you have, I don't know, Huffman coding and so on. So we develop a lot of explicit, uh, you know, explicit uh, kind of uh, ways of doing that. But now there is a deep learning approach in which you essentially set up an optimization problem in which you say, okay, I would like to have a mapping that kind of maps my vectors to some other vectors, maybe smaller vectors, or maybe in a way that this mapping involves a bottleneck that is kind of very small vector. And what I ask is saying, I still want to be able to you know, encode them in such a way that I can decode them. And kind of what you happen is that what you hope to happen is that these transformations that this you know, encoding and decoding networks represent, they actually lead to, you know, uh, they actually like, well, of course, you know, if you decode something, you encode it, it's still roughly the same thing. And this is actually a nice way when you kind of tune it right to kind of figure out what are the most salient aspects of the inputs you are trying to compress. So like this is kind of what compression is about. So it's a lossy compression usually, but you know, kind of it can be quite impressive if you set it, set it up right. And, and, and there also like the architectures there are kind of important because you, uh, because that's how you regularize if there's even like an you know, actual compression happening, uh, you know, that's kind of how you control it. Uh, great. Yeah, I, I especially mentioned because I think this word to vec which are based on this concept of autoencoders actually currently are in use in almost everywhere. Like when you go to Amazon and you will get some recommendations, most probably that's the way that played some role. So in some sense, you may even not know what is deep learning, but everything that even the uh, uh, like the the items that you will purchase from Amazon are based on deep learning. In that sense. It is important that like yes. how deeply deep learning essentially is already embedded in our life. Uh, great. So uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about the adversarial attack for deep learning. I think that's one of the areas that you have done. I think like you must like it more about this one. And yes, so uh, have to talk about. Although I, I will need to be going in in soon because you know I need to pick up something, but. Uh, Me too. Uh, you know, that's kind of uh, unfortunate because that's the, the exciting thing to me. So uh, essentially, adversarial attack is kind of, you know, so there was something very fun, uh, funny and fun uh, that kind of was discovered as people started like playing with deep learning. They realized that, you know, okay, so deep learning seems to work very well on average. Like if I have a distribution on which I want to train my model and I want to predict on the distribution, uh, you know, like deep learning seems to work amazingly well. But then there is something that they realized that actually you can start, like when you start, want to, tr well, essentially if you look at the worst case notion of prediction, then this amazing performance essentially break down, breaks down completely, completely. And the best way to illustrate that is something called adversarial examples. So, so uh, what are uh, adversarial examples? So adversarial examples are essentially, uh, you know, uh, kind of images. So I, let's say I take an image of a cat and then what I do is I find a way and you do it like essentially to add a bit of noise to that image. It's not a random noise. It's a noise that is created in a certain specific way, like to use optimization to figure out what to change. But the point is that this noise is imperceptible to you as a human. Like essentially, like if I look at the image after I added this noise and before, you will not be able to tell the difference. So to you, you know, I have a cat here, I have a cat here, and you know, that's two cats, identical cats to me. But then what happens is that even though on the original image, your model might have predicted a cat. After adding this noise, you can essentially make your model say whatever class you want. Like you can say, this is a dog, this is a guacamole, this is a, this is a pig, this is an airplane. Essentially like somehow by adding this imperceptible noise, you can completely fool the model into seeing, you know, something, uh, you know, completely like, you know, completely different, completely what you want to, what you want to do. And that was kind of, well, cool, first of all, but then like after being cool, it became quite scary, right? Like what's going on? Like why are these things failing in such a, a tremendous way? So like, actually much of my work was, you know, was exactly to, you know, uh, much of my work was exactly to figure out, you know, how, like what's going on? First of all, like how can we protect against this kind of behavior. This is the adversarial robustness question. And that's what my first paper in deep learning was about. 
but then also of trying to understand, okay, but why is it happening? Like, like where, is this, where are these problems coming from? And essentially, like, long, uh, uh, long story short, this is actually a fascinating story uh, that, you know, like, this is one of the papers that I'm really proud of, is just kind of that tries, to, that manages to deep, like, dig deeper into, you know, into what, why this is happening is kind of, you know, essentially, like, you know, the realization there is that kind of we view this fact that I can add this noise to my, you know, to my image and change the perception of my model as a bug of my model. But in some ways, what really happens is that this is a feature. Like essentially, like what this really is, is, is not just, it's not, it's not a manifestation of the fact that our model failed. It's actually succeeded. Just the notion of succeed, success is not what we realized kind of uh, we are asking it to do. So it's like the model actually succeeds. It just succeeds not in the way we envision it to succeed. So let me try to make it a little bit clear. It's essentially like, okay, imagine I want to train my model to recognize, you know, to have a diff like recognize difference between cats and dogs. And again, how do I do it? Well, I tell the model like, look, here's a bunch of cats, here's a bunch of dogs with labels, train on that. And then during the testing, I will show you pictures of cats and dogs and you will need to tell me which is which. And kind of, you know, and you know, that's what we do. So we kind of, you know, have, like have some, we have some collections of pictures of cats and dogs. We held out some for testing, we train on the other, and we, then we test our model on, you know, on this test example, everything seems to be fine. Everything works great. Okay, clearly the model learned how to distinguish cat versus dog. Yes. However, the realization is that actually that's something that we want to conclude but that's not what we can conclude. So essentially what happens is that you have to remember that the model by itself, it has no concept of what a dog Absolutely. or a cat is. All it knows is like, think of this as a kind of lazy but smart student who doesn't want to study to the whole semester and just, just figures out what do I need to do to pass the exam, okay? And I, and I know what kind of questions I will be asked on the exam. So I just, I just care about passing the exam. Maybe if it's a test, I know that this teacher likes to usually make, you know, the option C as the correct answer. So I just like to learn stuff like that. I don't care about knowledge. I just care about passing the test. And then what happens is that the models, actually they are this kind of lazy but smart students and they figure out how to distinguish the pictures of dogs from cats that you are showing into this, but they do it in a different way than how we humans do it. So we as humans, we look at the, you know, shape of an ear, the fur, kind of the snout, but, you know, and we expect that anyone who is able to solve this task does it this way, but that's not true. The models actually figure out how to look at some crazy stuff, like kind of, you know, some differences in the intensity of different pixels, you know, maybe XORD or whatever happening there. And they realize that that works equally well or even better uh, for distinguishing uh, these pictures. So then what happens is that now, you know, when I kind of try to fool this model, what I really am doing is I'm just changing these kind of things that to me don't matter to my recognition if this is a dog or a cat, but actually exactly touch on all these heuristics that the model developed. So actually, if you look at this noise that we are adding, it's actually not noise to a model, it's actually features that correspond that the model learned to recognize, you know, pictures of a dog versus pictures of a cat. So this is actually like a very important understanding because it says that saying, oh, if you don't want to have behaviors like that, your job is not to fix your model. It's actually your job is to really structure the learning in such a way that the only way to succeed at this learning is to actually learn the features you want as opposed to whatever features give you the correct answer. And that kind of, you know, unfortunately is much more challenging, but essentially that's the reality that kind of shows that all of that we are doing about this so-called robust learning, we need to figure out how to align, you know, our intuitive understanding of what, the, what solving the task means to some mathematically precise definition that kind of pushes the model to align their understanding of, you know, of, of the task with our understanding of the task. So anyway, it, there could be a one hour lecture on that. This is kind of yeah. a very- Let me just mention briefly, I think that my understanding from that, uh, I think that that's actually a very nice point that you have mentioned. So in some sense you say that, I mean, if we can fool a model that learns like a cat being cat, it means that we found some uh, places that we can change this model. And this model now essentially becomes 
like full and does not understand that it is a cat. So in some sense, this model currently understand from this subset of features. And this subset of features in some sense are not the correct one, or maybe we should extend it if we want to make sure that it understands uh, like these are not the correct ones. So in some sense, these are like a, still a good set of features to know and probably to avoid them or like extend them such that we, from the, all these features, now we see that whether it is a cat or dog. Does it make any sense or like? Uh, it? it does, yes. So this is exactly like the point is that like, first of all, yeah, there's the realization that like, the reason why the model works this way is again, is not necessarily bad. It just is different. And in particular, like you might say that some of these features might be actually things that you would not think about, but actually some of them might actually be, make sense or essentially like it's about, you are kind of letting your model discover some new symmetries or regularities in the world, data that you might not have seen. So in particular, yes, maybe in vision, you really want, what you want to do is you want to make the model think the way you think because you want to replicate this particular human capability. But in the other context, like when you analyze, you know, like trying to discover cyber attacks or you want to use machine learning for like chemistry or like scientific discovery, you actually want to be able to extract things and principles and features and patterns that you are not aware of, that you would never be able to aware of. So then in some ways this becomes a feature, not a bug that you kind of, you know, that this model is just solving this task in a way that you would never think about solving it. So, so, so that's exactly the point. The same, some, in some sense, it's like you just need to be more deliberate about first recognizing that the way the model might be solving this task is different than how you solve it. But then, you know, like view it again as a, something that's just to embrace the saying, Okay, yes, some of these things may be undesirable, but some of them might be very desirable. And you just need to be more proactive about kind of managing the set of features that the model learns. Yeah, I think that also answers my next question that you mentioned. This is actually the title that you have it. Adversarial examples are not bugs, they are features. I think that's exactly the one that yeah. you mentioned. I think that was very nice, actually, view of that you talked about three concepts here, like adversarial attack, robust system, and like features, somehow connecting all of them together. And that's actually the benefit that we will find. This. So is there any way that we can find this kind of attack I mean, the people have found some kinds of, uh, uh, like, how can we find these attacks? Like, is there any systematic way to find it? Yeah, so it, it's kind of actually quite easy because you can set it up as an optimization problem. You are just saying that now instead of, opt like, optimizing model to fit the particular kind of for a given image to give you desired input, what you do is you fix the model because you actually train the model and then you try to say, okay, I can just now modify the pixels and I want to get a desired, you know, a desired <laughs> effect. So it's actually very easy to find these things. And then of course you can ask, okay, what if I don't tell you how my model exactly works? Well, then you can just try to learn it from a query access. You can just say, okay, but you will, I will be asking you questions about inputs and you will give me the labels. And from that, I will reconstruct roughly kind of the inner workings of your model to kind of get the attack. So, so there are like, there's the whole industry of people coming up with like, different ways of coming up with these attacks, you know, subject to different constraints. But yes, it is in the end, it is, it, is, uh, it is quite easy. So the difficult part is to really controlling and kind of defending against these attacks. Uh, great. So I think this is actually very important. But, and uh, can they happen? I think they can happen in, not just in deep learning it, uh, or they can happen on other things. Like, for example, uh, in like, a XG, uh, like an XG boost or other type of things. It's three yes. based things. Uh, uh, Yes. Yeah, yeah. So that's an excellent point. It's like, yeah. So even though like this, actually, okay, in science, nothing is discovered first time. You know, it's like, you know, there's a saying that in the only thing, uh, you know, uh, regarding like, you know, only thing worse than being scooped on a result is to kind of, is to be too early with a result. Like, yeah, so essentially, or like, the, I think the other saying is that like, it's important to, you know, kind of be the one that discovers the given phenomena as the last one. Right, because, so okay, so the point is that these things actually were discovered before deep learning, but then people didn't pay attention to it because essentially at that time, machine learning didn't work even in average case, yeah? So why would you care about it not working in the worst case? But then like, yes, you deep learning started to work in average case, people realize, oh, it doesn't work in the worst case, but yes, this is, there is nothing about deep learning 
in this problem. Like, yeah, the same things happen even for linear classifiers. For, you know, it's just because it's really about this much more fundamental issue is saying, you know, is my model like using the right features to solve the problem? And if not, I can manipulate this misalignment between how I wanted to solve task versus how it solves this to do that. So, so this is definitely like true for like, yeah, for random forest trees, for all, like, for any machine learning uh, classifier, uh, this is true. Uh, great. Okay, so I think that was good. So I think you may also have some uh, time restriction. Like uh, uh, given that, so uh, I think we have done discuss about these adversarial attacks and even how we can find them and some discussion on that. And uh, I think the people can read more about it. I think this intuition that you mentioned, it was great to me and hopefully it would be great for others as well. So uh, the uh, only other thing, so like in general, uh, do you want to add anything more about uh, like the network flow? work and some intuition on that one, maybe a few sentences on that one, because that's like also a great thing that you have done. And this kind of the concept of electrical fellow that you were considering. Sure, uh, okay, so, so, so yeah, okay. That, that's a, another kind of huge topic, right? So, so you are kind of yeah, making me quite, a, you know, quite an interesting position. So I think the, like that, like, I think two really remarkable things to me that happen in all of that is saying, okay, when you were, like when people are taught a maximum flow problem, you know, it traditionally is treated as a very combinatorial problem. And you kind of talk about, oh, the way I compute this is by just finding argumenting paths. So I find like, essentially like you use data structures, you kind of, you find paths and you think about this as a very kind of combinatorial structure. So, and you know, the fastest algorithms were all combinatorial. And then this was this kind of this crazy realization that maybe you should kind of back out from this view and actually view it, like embrace this question as a completely like, you know, continuous optimization question, right? And again, maybe for max flow, it, it's not as surprising in the end because yeah, the flow, you can imagine fractional flows, but it's also true for like matchings, bipartite matching. But you can actually, even though this in the end, you want to get a discrete assignment of, you know, of, you know, machines to jobs and so on, you actually like view it as a continuous or option when you kind of have fractional assignments. And it what it turns out is that once you are in this continuation world, essentially like, okay, so what makes computational problems difficult is kind of uh, switching between nearby configurations. Like the point is that, okay, I have some max flow and I want to get a better max flow. Well, I need to have this whole, a kind of you know a residual graph in which I kind of carefully keep track of like okay I remove the flow from this edge so I can flow this uh, this flow on this edge and, and I again this is beautiful and we made it work but like there was a real work in kind of trying to figure out how to go between you know from one from one solution to the next solution a uh, kind of in a relatively smooth way in constant optimization this all becomes much much easier like kind of in some ways what you are really doing is you are never committing yourself too much to 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 extreme solution and you kind of try to slowly feel your way and only towards the end really commit yourself to the extremal point of the kind of like an actual final solution that you find so that was one very beautiful and kind of powerful insight that kind of you you know sort of kind of make things more vague so you have more freedom in figuring out and zeroing, zeroing in and the space where the actual final solution is and in the end you are getting computer solution just like only at the very end this happens and not in So that's one thing. And the other crazy thing to me was because again, especially because of connection to physics and kind of actually there is a bigger story like electrical flows are kind of something that happens in all of my life uh, in theory. Uh, and again, it was not known by design was that if you think about, okay, you know, now if you need to, like you start with some initial, uh, like, you know, uh, solution to max flow in this kind of con uh, continuous optimization view, and then you ask, okay, so how do I improve? How do I get a better flow? So how do I navigate this space of initial solutions to, the, to zoom in on the optimal solution? Well, if I think of what are my deltas, like what are my updates to my flow, they essentially like the problem that you are setting up is essentially an electrical flow problem. So it's actually like you can make this intuition make much more direct. I have a paper, I think it's in 2000. 14, I think, no, 2016. It's, 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 I think, Fox 2016, where I make it like completely explicit. But essentially like what you can do is you can just show an algorithm in which you build the flow by just argumenting it with electrical flows. So essentially like, you know, this was more implicit in the previous work, but you can make it explicit. Like essentially like it turns out that the Oracle that kind of you use for 
figuring out how should I update my solution to make it better in this kind of acquisition world is exactly the electrical flow, notion of electrical flow that we know from physics. Like exactly that you have some resistances and you figure out, you know, how to essentially send, you know, one unit of flow from S to T uh, while minimizing the energy. And it turns out that these flows are very nice because they connect to solving linear systems, Laplacian systems, and you can do it very fast. But anyway, this is an absolutely beautiful uh, piece of algorithms that I, you know, enjoy discovering uh, and kind of, yeah, it, it brought me a lot of joy uh, to do all of that. Yeah, and the thing, I mean, the people can read, I think that uh, Fox 2016 paper, probably one of the best that they can read to get the most ideas and the explanation on that. Yes. So I think, uh, uh, yeah, so I think the last question, and then we can, I think, finish the, this one. So what is your uh, final message for some higher schoolers or like even maybe even elementary or middle school that who want to go to computer science or more theory, I mean, both theory or actually MN, what they should do? Like, this is the question that actually might be useful for my child even, or <laughs> yes. other children that what they should do, they should go and learn programming, they should go and like, design website, they should try to write a, like program games, uh, like they're playing games, lots of other options. What do you... Yeah, so, so that's a good question. Again, I also have, you know, uh, children that like for whom I, I will need to figure out the answer to it soon. Actually, I should be there already in elementary school. So, uh, you know, so definitely like uh, that's the time. Like, I don't know, like meaning in the sense that I don't think there is one path to success. What I do think, and again, this is very difficult, by the way, when I look back to me in the elementary school and so on, I realize how much time I've wasted. Like in the sense that like, you are not focused person there. It's like you are just doing stuff. You are spending a lot of time watching TV, reading books, whatever. But like, I think the important thing is to really, like, if you can, to apply yourself to something that you are really passionate about. And like, I really think that it does not matter that much at that time what exactly you do. The important thing is that you are really, really good at this. And like, kind of, so it's more about the kind of the magnitude and not necessarily direction. If you want to play games, you know, if you can play them at competitive level, you know that there is kind of, you are applying yourself in some, like you are challenging yourself and showing kind of, you know, figuring out what is your passion and really pursuing it. Because I think the specific passions will change over your life. Maybe you now want to do theory, maybe you will want to do machine learning, or maybe you will want to do now machine learning, you will want to do theory or music or something. But what will be the transferable skill is this ability to really immerse yourself and kind of commit yourself, okay, I am really passionate about that. And, you know, I just want to really go all in on that. So I think this is the skill that, by the way, will differentiate you from, you know, from many other people in whatever area you choose. It's just like the focus and ability to really kind of go beyond just, oh, doing a bit of this, doing a bit of that, but actually figuring out what you are passionate about and what you are good at and just being able to really pursue it uh, with, you know, wholeheartedly. So again, it's difficult. I just want to be very clear, it's difficult. But this is, if I look at all the brilliant students I interacted with and all the other people, like that was the one quality that, you know, kind of is, is there. They just kind of have this ability to really immerse themselves into the problem and really kind of push it hard and kind of in a sustained way. So, you know, uh, that- So it's not go deep. Any areas that you want, go deep. Because this, I think that is that I mentioned actually to my children. The way that you will train your brain to go deep, that's the way that remains for you, independent of what you are doing. Maybe you are doing this now. I mean, tomorrow maybe you change the subject, but it's still this ability has been trained in your brain, so you can continue that. The same. I mean, you can do even a sport and other, but then you it just that brain is enough. Then you need to make hands and feet also come along. But that's essentially the idea. Uh, great. I think thanks for your time. I think it was great. So we will make this available for everyone to see it in Instagram, YouTube. And uh, I think hopefully they will enjoy it. I think we mentioned it was a limited time and lots of topics. But I think we tried to touch the important ones. Thanks again. And then I think yeah. uh, we will talk more maybe later on some other talks. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to talk to you and really good to see you. So hope I will see you soon now that the pandemic is over. So hopefully yeah. over. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. See you. Bye. Bye.